Good morning, all of you. Good morning. We're happy to have you here this morning. Uh, last Sunday before Thanksgiving, we hope that all of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving this year. Um, we've been very fortunate as far as weather, and I see Cleveland with a whole bunch of snow in the east, 10 inches, 14 inches. I'm very thankful <laughs> that it has not hit us yet, though we may have a white Thanksgiving. By way of announcements, <coughs> I do know that <coughs> we are planning this Saturday at 10 a.m. to have the hanging of the greens here. I'm glad there are no greens in our congregation because they may take it personal, but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Anyhow, the hanging of the greens, we will be putting up the Christmas tree and the wreath, so all of you are uh, welcome to come and help uh, be a fluffer, if nothing else, fluff them up <laughs> and get them up. If you're not comfortable on ladders, uh, Randy is. <laughs> so, there we go. <laughs> and so that's at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Are there other announcements this morning? Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Just a couple of items. I draw your attention to the bottom of page two with some announcements going on. Uh, I'll be having my office hours today from noon to three. Stop by, give me a call, shoot me an email. If you got something to complain about or praise about, I'm here. So come on by or call. Uh, Barb, of course, uh, would want me to tell you about the book study and the video coming up on Wednesday, Food Pantry. Um, not this Wednesday, though. Not this Wednesday? No. God, and here I was trying to be proactive. <clears throat> okay, when is it resuming? First Wednesday in December, please take note. Uh, you may have noticed we have a new addition up here at front. It is, as customary, we've done the last few years, starting this coming Sunday, we kick off our reverse advent calendar in which you have the option to consider uh, bringing in items for our food pantry. Uh, there is a uh, handout in Fellowship Hall and back there on the credenza right next to Randy. We'll be happy to give you one of items that we need for the pantry. Um, so take a look at that. Following the service today, uh, Connie from the homeless shelter, the refuge in Lapeer is coming here to collect all of the items that you so graciously, graciously have donated to the refuge. So we appreciate you participating uh, in that. Uh, our chimes, put out by our diligent editor and publisher, Mr. Dewey, is going to press later this week, I understand. And so if you have any additions to the prayer list, now would be the time to get something in so that can be fresh for the month of December. Finally, thank all of you for participating in what we call our Stewardship Light campaign. We have received a number of time and talents forms completed. There are still some folks that we would say it's still not too late. There are forms out on the sign-up table in Fellowship Hall if you haven't filled one out. So we can allocate how we're going to do our ministries and our various activities uh, here at the church. Last but not least, two more items, and then I'm going to introduce Ruth. Um, on the second Sunday in Advent, December the 8th, we are going to have here as our guest preacher, uh, Reverend Dr. Lillian Daniels, who is the chair of the Michigan Conference of the United Church of Christ. I don't know, at least in the time I've been here, where we've had the basically the boss of the Michigan Conference coming and preaching, so it'll be nice to have her come here and uh, talk a little bit about um, what's going on and how the UCC office in uh, Lansing is helping us and other churches across the state of Michigan. And lastly, from uh, the bottom of my heart and the rest of our family, um, and Elena, thank you for all of your expressions uh, and support uh, in this time regarding Martin. I will now turn it over for Ruth for a special announcement. Thank you. 
I think everybody here knows that Blakely Smith has been studying piano with me now for, what is it, three years now? Three years? And she's entered a competition or two, and this year she won first place in a recent competition that she went to Shelby Township for. Miss Bridget Scott, I'd like to present her trophy to Blakely Smith. Okay, thank you so much, Blakely. I love that. Just that boogie. <laughs> you gotta love that. And your slow, contemplative piece on the front. Such good phrasing, such, uh, such a, a good uh, touch on the piano. So thank you very much for that. It was, it was very special to hear you play. And especially seeing how you have progressed through these years from the very first time you played something here. And so that progression is so wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there 
Okay, well, that was a very good opening uh, to our service today. And so, a very good uh, Thanksgiving song this morning is Come, O Thankful People, Come on 422 in our hymnals. And please rise as you are able, and we'll sing this as Thankful People. <coughs> storms begin. God, our Maker, does provide. For our wants He does supply. Come to God's own temple. Come, praise the song of harvest home. All the blessings of the field, all the stores and gardens yield all the fruits in full supply ripening neath the summer sky all that spring with bounteous hand scatters o'er the smiling land all that liberal autumn pours with its rich or flowing stores. These to you, our God, we owe, source from whom all blessings flow, and for these our songs we raise, grateful vows and solemn praise. Come, ye thankful people, come, Raise the song of harvest home. Come to God's own temple. Come, raise the song of harvest home. Please join me in our call to worship. God, our creator, we call you Father mother and author of life. <clears throat> Christ, our Savior, we call you the Son, the Messiah, the one who saves. Holy Spirit, we call you the advocate, the inspirer, breath and wind of God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Dallas, in spirit, Christ and Creator. Shall we pray? Our Lord God, our own words are not enough to express your awesomeness, your majesty, your holiness. Our highest expression of theology are just like baby talk to you, your creation, your very self. Make us aware through your Holy Spirit that you are here among us this very hour. May this awareness lead us to approach this hour more carefully that the words that we speak, that the tunes that we sing this morning, the thoughts that we think, the joy and the sadness we feel, may all of these be pleasing to you. For in spite of the inadequacy of our words, 
this worship is addressed to you. Make it complete, whole, full of an overflowing. Oh God, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. to the Spirit, to Jesus Christ, to the eternal source. From the time of our beginnings, beyond death's flame upon us, life, light, and love shall never end. Amen. Join me as we read together our confession of sin. You call us and we ignore your whisper, listening to the voices of this world. You call us to be your voice in this world, to be your hands in this world, to be your feet in this world, to proclaim your peace, your comfort, forgiveness, healing, love, and grace. Forgive us, open our ears, call us again, and use us. Our God is a God of grace and forgiveness. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Before we do our scripture reading this morning, I'd like to have one more announcement. And there's just a, a wonderful concert coming up that uh, Doris is singing in. And there's a flyer out on the bulletin board out there, so you can look at that if you don't remember. But uh, remind us again, Doris, when what the two days are for that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so come for both of them. So that's not this Friday, but it's the next Friday after this one here. So uh, if you want to get into the Christmas spirit, they always are, are so good. And it definitely is going to get you into the Christmas spirit to, to go and, and listen to them. Okay, for our scripture this morning. Our scripture comes from the Old Testament from the prophet Jeremiah. And as far as background, we... Uh, had a very good king of Israel called King Josiah. And he was the last good king of Israel. And, after, and he did a lot of reforms in the temple. Uh, and unfortunately, he got killed in battle. In 609 B.C., before Christ, um, he was killed. And his son became king. And his son was called Jehoiakim. And so this reading today is going to be about Jehoiakim. Now, unfortunately, as happens sometimes, the son is not like his, the father. And so the son was not good. <laughs> he was not a good king. And during that time, there was a, a tremendous uh, empire to the, the east, Babylon, that was coming in. And they swept through the region. They defeated even the Egyptians. And Jehoiakim had to um, to kind of buy him off, send a whole bunch of gold and silver and things from the temple over to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And so um, they even took hostages uh, to try to maintain peace. But all of that was going to be for naught, as you'd find later on, uh, if you read later on in Jeremiah. And so it was turbulent times, and Jehoiakim doesn't seem to be too possessed to follow the words of God. So that's what we're going to be reading about today. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write, it in, write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to them in the reign, reign of Josiah until now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster that will be inflicted on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways, and I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Barak. And while Jeremiah dictated all the words of the Lord who had spoken to him, Barak wrote them down on the scroll. When Jeremiah told Barak, I am restricted. I am not allowed to go into the Lord's temple. So you go into the house of the Lord on the day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll of the words of the Lord that you wrote it as I <laughs> dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each turn from their wicked ways. For the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord is great. Barak did everything Jeremiah, the prophet, told him to do. And at the Lord's temple, he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. So then the king sent Jehudi, Jeh uh, <laughs> let's get this name right. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll and Jehudi brought it from the secretary and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter 
apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. When Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burnt in the fire. <laughs> That's one way to get rid of the words of the Lord, huh? <laughs> Throw them in the fire pot. After the king burnt the scroll containing the words that Barak had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came again to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. And more were added to it, by the way. <laughs> the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. The new covenant is that I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one, an one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. This is God's holy scripture. So I'd like to ask you all a question. How many of you remember taking in high school something called the ACT test? Oh, I have a friendly audience this morning. Okay. Yes, and for those of you that didn't raise your hands, that was a test to measure your aptitude in basic subject matter. Social studies, history, English. Then there was an aptitude test for math. I received a ACT math score of six. Not good. Not good. It was possible to get double digit scores, but nope, got six. Kind of tanked it, tried really hard, but looking on the bright side, I at least did some pretty nice double digits in social studies in history. Funny thing is, is even before I took that ACT test, I knew I was going to have to, from that point, after I took the test until I graduated from high school, I was going to have to work much, much harder to learn math, to the point where I had to have my parents hire tutors. So I could at least get a D or a C minus with a lot of effort, mind you, behind that in math. So. The other challenge that took place about, oh, I would say about two years before I took that ACT test and gave me a harbinger of things to come, in 1972 in seventh grade, Bothwell Middle School, we started to learn the times tables, right? One times one, two times three. Well, everybody around me whizzed through it their seventh grade Guess who was still struggling after seventh grade, going into eighth grade? Yep. Wasn't a pretty thing. Wasn't pretty. But the market public school system says you have to learn the times tables and know them before you go into eighth grade. So it was, again, really in the latter part of eighth grade that I finally learned them. My poor parents spent hours, mostly my dad. With, remember the flashcards? You probably had to memorize those. Yep. I don't know if the prophet Jeremiah ever had to learn his timetables, but Jeremiah certainly had a thing or two to say in scripture today about learning a particular subject. Jeremiah 
had a very long and challenging vocation as a prophet in the southern Israelite kingdom of Judah, which, as Steve alluded to, includes the temple located in Jerusalem. Jeremiah lived, as you heard in the introduction from Steve, during a very, very troubling time in the kingdom's history. The kingdom was basically devastated. People were hard hit by the occupying army. They wondered what's going to happen next. People were also being exiled to Babylonia to say that it was a very challenging time for the people of Judah and Jeremiah would be a gross understatement. Interestingly enough, today too we find ourselves in challenging times after our election, as I have said earlier, that has left us more polarized, I think, than any time in our nation's history. And in this time leading into Thanksgiving and Christmas, many find themselves hopeful in anticipating the new year, while many others find themselves fearful of what's going to come. In Jeremiah's time, there was a good share of fear by the people in the kingdom of Judah, not only dealing with the occupation by a foreign power, being in exile, but a king, Jehoiakim, who was less than an ideal king. He was also not one who really set a very good example of how one should live faithfully according to the teachings of God. King Jehoiakim, interestingly enough, not only encouraged idol worship, you all know about what idol worship is about, but he maintained a very nice and cushy lifestyle with the kings of other nations, sometimes taking lives to maintain his kingship, taking resources from the people who were out working the land, basically subjugating the kingdom of Judah for his own personal gain. That's our king this morning. Enter the prophet Jeremiah, who spoke against idol worship. He insisted that the king and all the people follow God's law, the same law handed down by God to Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai generations before. And also, Jeremiah urged to have all go back to the basic teachings of God, like caring for the poor, honoring the land God gave them for the king that Jehoiakim had and had power over, and reminding people, and especially King Jehoiakim, being a king is not about taking advantage of your people, but serving them. Now, you would be very, very right in saying that King Jehoiakim was not a very big fan of Jeremiah. I mean, who likes the voice of reason, right? And the religious elite in the temple circles of power were also not big fans of Jeremiah because Jeremiah called them out on the carpet. He called out the religious authorities for being less than ideal keepers of God's law and examples of holiness and righteousness. So Jeremiah was accumulating very quickly a big band of opponents because Jeremiah was doing what he was called to do by God, which is to speak out against religious hypocrisy of his time. Jeremiah said to the religious authorities that they had basically turned the temple into a den of robbers. That's right, a den of robbers. If you remember many years later, we know that Jesus said something similar to the religious elite of his time when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple and said, you have turned the house of the Lord into a den of thieves. Jeremiah also spoke often and loud about the shortcomings of the king of the time. He was not shy. He was not shy about calling out the abuses of the king in society and his actions and his policies that especially hurt the poor and the oppressed. Because he was a critic, surprise, surprise, Jeremiah was shunned by the religious elite in the temple. He was banned from the temple, banned from the king's palace, and eventually Jeremiah was sent to prison by the authorities for speaking out, for speaking out. So it's against this backdrop this morning that we learn today about the people of Judah and the temple authorities receiving a scroll written by Jeremiah through his scribe Barak. We learn that the words contained in that scroll, as Steve read, and read in the temple, call for the people of Judah and its leaders to repent, reform, and to return to the ways of God. So basically, 
in reading that temple scroll, how do you think King Jehoiakim reacted upon hearing Jeremiah's words that were read in the temple? Like this. Throw it in the fire. Give me the scroll so I can rip it up. That's what the king wanted to do. That's essentially what he did upon hearing Jeremiah's words. But you know something? God was not deterred by the king's reaction. Through Jeremiah, we hear today some of the most profound and wonderful words in the Old Testament from our God and our creator about what was God going to do next for the people of Judah, future generations, and us. Us. Yes. Words that came from Jeremiah that offered hope hopeful message and a new way of how the creator from that time moving forward to now will engage the people and us and us. We see in our scripture this morning some interesting points. We see how God gave to the people what I would call for lack of a better term divine amnesia divine amnesia God says to Jeremiah that he is going to forgive the sins of the past generations, the current generations, and the future generations, and us, and turn a new page as our creator. Think about that. This was God, God going forward on God's initiative and saying, you all have a new slate. I have forgotten your sins. Forget about it. We're in a new world. We're in a new time. I forgive you. God said, I forgive you, humanity. I forgive your wickedness. For generations, if you remember, God had repeatedly, year after year after year, witnessed the sinful nature of humanity. God heard the promises the people made in the past. God, forgive me of my sins. I will never do it again, right? And yet the people continue to sin, right? God forgave. God forgave people's sins. And here, in Jeremiah's words, God's grace goes up a notch to a new level. God says, I will not only forgive your sins, but I will remember. I will forgive and forget. I will no longer remember all the sins that you did. That's awesome. God forgiving. God having divine amnesia. God turns basically in these words, my friends, a new leaf over and gives unmerited grace, unmerited, undeserved grace to us and to the people of Jeremiah's time and the generations before us. We have received unmerited grace. God shines through in scripture today, interestingly enough, and I think you can kind of relate to this, like a parent. Right? We've talked a lot about God being a parent, father and mother. How many of you as parents have forgiven over and over some of the shortcomings, some of the sins of your children and looked forward, cleaned a new slate? That's our God this morning. Jeremiah gives us in scripture this morning abundant, loving grace from God. Grace that knows no bounds. We know all about grace, right? This is unmerited and unlimited grace that God says to us this morning, as he did to the people in Jeremiah's times. We also see in scripture today how God, through Jeremiah, basically clears all the deck chairs from the ship and moves forward, moves forward, doesn't look back, goes forward. With everyone's sins now forgiven, there is now a time to focus on the future. The future. So how does God move forward this morning in Jeremiah? He enacts a new agreement, or as we know so well, a new, a brand new in Jeremiah this morning, covenant. A new covenant with humanity and us. God says through Jeremiah, I will be their God and they will be my people. Those words should kind of be a little familiar to them and to us. Recall the history of the covenants God has made with humanity 
over the years and up until our time in Jeremiah this morning. Remember the first covenant, right? God gives the first covenant or what I would call a covenant story in Genesis 1. You remember? Adam and Eve. They're in the garden. God invites them to live according to God's wishes and not eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Of course, we know how that turned out. But then God gave humanity what some have called after that experience with Adam and Eve, five foundational covenants. So the covenant story, if you will, in Adam and Eve, but now five new foundational covenants. Follow along with me for a minute. Remember the covenant, right, that God made first with Noah. That is number one. Sin has enveloped the land, and in response, what happens? What does God do? Water envelops the world, cleaning the way of the sins of earth and humanity to a new restored creation that will start with Noah and his family. God entering into a relationship with that first covenant with Noah for the first time with humanity and says, God, thank you, Noah says, that you will never flood the earth again. The Noah covenant. Number two, remember this one. This one probably should really stick out with all of us. The Abrahamic covenant, right? Number two. After evil continued to infiltrate the world, God moved to call Abraham into a covenantal, redemptive relationship with God. God basically says to Abraham, you're going to have a big family, you are going to inherit the land, and you will have descendants as what? Numerous as the stars. Number two, the Abrahamic covenant. And then, of course, the one I think we all know the best, number three, the third covenant that God gave to humanity, the Mosaic Covenant, right? God sends Moses to deliver the people out of bondage and sin in Israel, excuse me, in Egypt and into the promised land. And in this new covenant, this third covenant that God issues, he just asks the people to do one thing. Obey my teachings. Follow the Ten Commandments. And in turn, God will bless all the people. We know how that didn't turn out too well, right? Perhaps we knew what's coming next. Our fourth covenant, the Davidic covenant, right? God's people enter the land of milk and honey, Canaan. They demand a king. God says, go ahead, have your king. And then, of course, we see the first king, Saul, who ultimately fails to obey God. And then God sends forward David to be the next king over Israel. And as we know, David becomes a successful leader. God makes a covenant with David and says, your name is going to be wonderful and great. So those are our covenants that lead up to what we find today in this new covenant that God enacted in the time of Jeremiah and for us. But you know what's different about this covenant compared to the ones in the past is that this is very, very unique. This new covenant that Jeremiah gives us this morning, it still has the fundamental premises of past covenants, right? God is going to take care of all of us. And all God wants in return is that the teachings of God be followed by people, the commandments be followed. But over and above what is very, very special about this new covenant in Jeremiah this morning is that God says he's going to imprint his teachings into the hearts of humanity, including us. So humanity can do a better job of adhering to its part of the bargain, the covenant. Imprinting the teachings of God into the hearts of everyone. When you say imprint, that's very strong. That is very all-encompassing. It's a new covenant that God unveils that is going to be everlasting. I mean, God says this morning he will write God's law into the hearts of his people. And then at the same time, and this is what is so awesome for us to think about, bring us complete forgiveness of sins and then clear the way for a future king to come from the lineage of another king, Jesus Christ who one day will restore all that has been broken between God and humanity. A little opening there to see who is getting the baton next, from King David to Jesus. So in the time of Jesus, we kind of get a new covenant, if you remember. Next Sunday, we're going to do what? On the first Sunday of every month, we do what? We do communion, right? We hear the words of a new covenant 
in the words of institution during communion, right? You remember Jesus with his disciples said, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for forgiveness of sins. That new covenant that Jesus talked about in the Lord's Supper was based on humanity realizing that the blood that Jesus would shed on the cross would take away the sins of the world. Different contrast, right? Different than past covenants in which humanity basically atoned for its sins through sacrifices and burning of incense at the temple. So Jesus comes and gives a new covenant that will come into the future and after what we see in Jeremiah this morning. Perhaps more so than anything else this morning, Jeremiah shows us this new covenant with a new meaning. We hear about God's new covenant in verse 34. If you remember these words, God says through Jeremiah that because humanity has received the new covenant through Jeremiah, future generations, the ones that will come right after the time of Jeremiah, all the way up to where we are right now, future generations will need to acquire basically what God says, a new kind of faith. In other words, our faith in God must be acquired and learned and nurtured in ways that allow our faith to last. I'll bring back those wonderful kind tables to make a point here about that. I memorized them. I memorized them over and over, but it wasn't enough. I had to eventually get to the point where I could go beyond memorization and know how to deploy the times tables, use them day in and day out without thinking. Just by repetition, just thinking about it, it was there, it was imprinted upon me, those times tables. So then when I was in the daily, daily activities of life, I could do them without counting on my hands. It was just in my DNA. That's what I mean by, in this new covenant, God is saying, you have to know them. Not just memorize them, but practice them and do them without thinking about it. That is the requirement that God gave with this new covenant. Same analogy if we're talking about just simply memorizing something but not doing it automatically, whether it's about the times tables, I think can be applied to the Ten Commandments, right? We memorize them. Probably in Sunday school, our teachers said, you've got to learn the Ten Commandments. You've got to be able to recite them, maybe in front of the church. Some today call for the Ten Commandments to be placed in schools and capitals. All well and good. But if we only memorize the Ten Commandments, but never put them into practice daily without thinking, so they become second nature, they lose their effectiveness, right? If we memorize the Beatitudes, blessed be, etc., etc., but do not put them into practice daily without thinking, they lose their power. So that's what God is saying about this new covenant this morning. Know my teachings, but know them so well that you just do them without thinking, day in and day out. God said in verse 4, No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Essentially what God is saying in those words is that God's teachings, knowing them is not enough. Daily adhering to those teachings should be what people need to do. The teachings of God should be embedded into the fabric of our bodies so that we go and do and go and do without prodding and nagging from God. So today, I leave you with this. Hold on to what we heard today about this new covenant of hope and a promise given to us by God in Jeremiah. God's word was a light shining in the darkness in very difficult times for the people of Judah. God's words of light will help us too in our longest days and our darkest nights and the future that we find ourselves in now and to come. God's promises too, my friends, in Jeremiah showed the people then as they do us now that God never abandoned humanity in the time of Jeremiah and will never abandon him. 
So study the words of Jeremiah and the God-initiated, God-initiated new covenant and new relationship with humanity that we heard in Jeremiah today. Resolve, my friends, resolve to grow in faith and resolve to continue carrying out in words and deeds and without ceasing and without thinking and without question God's teachings, especially now in the times we find ourselves in. Because we know these teachings so well, and if we continue to nurture them and practice them without thinking, it will do a great service to our brothers and sisters who are the least among us and will especially need our hands and voices going forward. Finally, may we also resolve today to continue growing in our faith and acting out daily God's commandments and deploying them without thinking, not just memorizing them like times tables, but using them without thinking as God's people now and in the years to come. Amen. Now let's continue on with our service this morning with our hymn number 420, We Praise You, O God. Now let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, this morning, we thank you for the new covenant that you took the initiative, that you unveiled to the people, that builds upon your covenants of the past and that we now use every day and you want us to use every day as far as our part of the covenant. To know your teachings and to practice them without thinking. Practice them, your teachings, without ceasing. Embolden us, God, to deepen our faith. Speak to us daily through the Holy Spirit and through your Son, Jesus, so that we can be the servants you ask us to be. Lord, we are grateful servants. We thank you for all the blessings that you have and continue to bestow upon us. Thank you for where we live. We thank you for the country, the city, the towns, the townships, all the places where we live. We thank you. You have blessed us in so many ways that, frankly, God, we sometimes take for granted. So we thank you with great gratitude for you, what you have given us. Thank you especially for our children, our grandchildren, our friends, all those that have and continue to be in our lives or enter and leave our lives with a quick help or a quick thank you or a quick smile. 
Lord, we thank you for our men and women in the military who serve and protect us, including those in the National Guard still deployed, taking care of the disasters that befall our country with the hurricanes. We pray especially for our men and women in the military who are in harm's way overseas, wherever they may be. Watch over them, God. God, we also thank you in appreciation for those here locally that help us, police and firefighters, our first responders, all in the medical community that help us. And the unsung heroes we never hear about, we thank you for them as well. Lord, we continue to look forward. We have worries. We have thoughts. We are dealing with losses that you know so well. You know these losses that we're worrying about before they even come into our minds. And so, Lord, we ask you again. We implore you to never leave our sides. You and the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. Be with us and continue to be as close as the breath you gave us that we breathe in and out every day so we can feel your embrace, feel your breath, and feel your Holy Spirit. Lord, we also ask you to bless the peacemakers. May we work together with them to bring peace. Peace is what we need in the Middle East, what we need in Ukraine. And Lord, we also look inward in our congregation. We pray for health and healing for those listed in our prayer list, including Glenn and all the folks named in our prayer this morning, and for Dennis, for Tom and Emily, for Patty and Donna in Virginia, and for Terry. We pray for all those in our church family and elsewhere who are mourning. We ask for protection from harm, those that are in war-torn areas. And we also send our memories to those, our members and friends who are homebound and not with us this morning. And now, Lord, please especially listen as we say to you silently or out loud our own prayers and petitions to you. Lord, I put a pray for Jennifer, for Noah, and I also pray for protection from harm, Vladimir, Dennis, and Alexei, near the front lines of Russia's war with Ukraine. Lord, we pray for parts of our world that are aching and breaking apart, enduring natural challenges, including those affected by the bomb cycle, which is sweeping through the northwest United States and parts of Canada that have least left many people dead, many without power. And Lord, finally, we pray for the people of Ukraine who mark 1,000 days of enduring war under Russia. As the violence continues to take hold, we ask your peace to finally come for your people. Lord, having heard our prayers and petitions, would you please hear us now as we say together out loud the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Would you please rise if you are able? God from whom all blessings flow, praise God all creatures here below, praise God. Please join me now in saying together our offertory prayer. God, take our lives and our gifts, use them to accomplish more than we could possibly imagine, so that us, at your kingdom might come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now let's conclude our service today, shall we, by singing hymn number 419, Now Thank We All Our God. My friends, I leave you with this benediction. Remember the words of God this morning. I will be your God and you will be my people. So with the new covenant from Jeremiah, go and follow and without thinking, do the teachings of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.